Hello, friends. Hello, everybody. Good morning, Lou. Good morning. How are we doing today, doctor? I'm good. I'm good. Um, you know, there was snow this morning. There you was? You had snow this morning. We had snow, yes. Oh, wow. It didn't last very long, but there was snow. April snow. I like it. All right. yeah, it's cold. As long um, as I don't have to shovel it at the end, yeah, it's all yeah, fine. Yeah, no, it all melted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, friends, today we are going to embark on what is going to be, not today, but the next session, is going to be a very, very important series of uh, verses that we're going to be talking about. Something that I find very helpful, probably very subtle in terms of the philosophy that I think you will enjoy. But this today's verses, which are chapter 4, verses 19 through 24, are a sort of a foundation to get to that point. So you should uh, know it. And here's what it's talking about. It's talking about a self-realized person. Um, and, and what does that person do? What does he look like? How does he behave? That kind of thing. We already saw that uh, to some extent in our previous uh, talks on Sthita Pragna. But this is a sort of repetition, but also slightly different. And then towards the end, it comes to what you and I need to do to, even if you and I cannot be self-realized in this lifetime, to get on that ladder so we can go up at least one rung in this lifetime. So let's talk about verse 19. Verse 19 basically talks about a self-realized person and his or her actions. And it says the actions of such a self-realized person are free from vasanas or desires. Therefore, there is no bondage to the world. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? I mean, we, we, don't, we sort of take it for granted, but it's necessary for us to evaluate what that means. It means that his actions or her actions are free from any desires and free from any expectations. What binds us when we do an action? What binds us to the world? And that is your desire. You have a desire, you're doing something, but your mind is already focused on, am I going to get a bonus from my boss if I do a good job? Right. Am I going to do a going to get some money? Am somebody going to get me a pat on the back? There's always an expectation. There's a desire to get a pat on the back or a bonus. There's an expectation that I'm doing this. And so what happens is your action binds you to the world. In that, you have that expectation. The other thing is that once you get it, let's say you get a reward, you are afraid of losing. We went through this already, so right. I'm not going to yep. go through it in detail. Mm -hmm. um, but in brief, you have an expectation and a fear that you might lose this, whatever you got, or you have a desire for more. So it becomes a vicious cycle, and right. that binds you to the world. The actions of a self-realized person are free from vasanas, so there is no bondage to the world. And why? Because he knows. He has a fire of knowledge, it says. And so the wise people, not the average person, but the wise people consider him to be a, um, a, a sage, a wise man, a muni, a rishi. Mm -hmm. So let's examine that. To what does a self-realized person look like? I mean, if a person, if Buddha was born a prince and he looked a certain way, when he became self-realized, it's an interesting story that you should all either watch the movie or read the book about Buddha, how he spent his lifetime in the forest losing weight because he said, I want to not give in to the desire to eat food. And he became like thin as a rail. Mm -hmm. And then he said, this is not working. He said, if you pull the string too tight for a violin, it breaks. Right. If you leave it too lax, you can't play music. It has to be just right. So he went back and forth until he finally gained enlightenment. And after that, he didn't look any different. He looked the same as he did before. The only difference was that his mind, and this is key, no longer had the kama crow the lobe. Kama is desire and craving and lust. Crow is anger, when you don't get your way, um, anger. And the third is lobe, which is greed, wanting more. Hmm. Those three, the Gita says, are the gateway to hell, right? Kama crow the lobe, which is desire, anger, 
and greed are the is the gateway to hell because as you fall into that trap uh, you go down your descent is guaranteed and such a realized person as we were talking about gautam buddha looks the same but he no longer has this calm crowd lobe why because he is self realized mm. so what is the difference between a self realized person and us how does he get to that point where he no longer has those desires those expectations how he no longer has this greed uh, or anger or desires and for that we need to understand something that we've not talked about so far which is the three states of consciousness our inner atman is pure consciousness imagine that if you were to take a bulb and you look at the bulb and you look at what electricity is coming there what that bulb looks like whether it's a white bulb a red bulb a blue bulb the light may be different but the electricity is pure there's no uh, it's not conditioned by anything All right we are conditioned so in what are the three levels of conditioning that our mind our atman goes through one is the waking state that's what we are right now mm-hmm. the waking state is where everything we look around us are per- organs of perception ears nose eyes see things that's all the perceptions on the waking mind you experience the world of objects and of beings while being awake then you go to sleep and you have two stages in the de- in sleep one is the dream state in the dream state you experience the world of objects beings and thoughts in the dream state you might imagine yourself being somebody different you might imagine your home being different your financial status being different your spouse different whatever it is that's all is it true no not according to the waking state so in the waking state you look at that and you say now nah, that was just a dream it wasn't true right if you use the barometer of the waking state being truth and then you fall into a deep sleep state which is known so the waking state is known as the physical with the physical body the waker the subtle body is the dream state so the subtle body is known as the dream state and at that time you are in the realm of emotions and thoughts the causal body and is caused it is called causal because it causes everything to happen mm mm-hmm. how does it cause in the deep state deep sleep state you don't know anything when you wake up you say you're still alive because you say i was in a state of deep sleep i didn't know anything but you knew that you were asleep that's how you say i was in a state of deep sleep mm-hmm. that is where the seeds of your desires are come out so you remember we talked previously about prakriti mm-hmm. prakriti is all the vasanas and experiences that we have had for all our previous lives it's unbelievable how much can be stored inside that causal body from previous from the prakriti all thousands and thousands of lives all of that is buried inside that causal body not all of it is available to us in this one lifetime maybe just a fraction of it is available but it's all there just like in a computer it's right. all not it's there but not available to you at the surface that causal body causes the vasanas and the seeds of the desires to come about otherwise it's blankness and nothingness now in the dream state as i'm dreaming that i'm a king and i'm surrounded by you know uh, riches and wealth and all of that and i'm about to be crowned the monarch of the entire you know world or whatever and i wake up mm-hmm. now I realized that that was just a dream. And there are some times where you wake up and say, "Wow, I wish I could go back to that dream because it just felt so good." Right. But most of the time you say, "You know what? That was just a dream. I don't want to go back there. Let's get to have my cup of coffee, tea, and move on with the world." A self-realized person realizes that this waking world is an important concept, friends, for you to all understand that a self-realized person sees that in the waking world to him this is just a dream that brahman atman has created all of this it's all brahman but acting out in this way that our real purpose in life is just to become one with brahman become one with the atman so this is all 
for naught. So to him, a self-realized person, he says, what do I want to go back into this waking world for? I'd rather just be continue on my path to become self-realized. So to him, it is the same, the analogy of what you would experience in a dream when you wake up. You say, yeah, it was nice, but I don't want to go back there because it's artificial. Right. Similarly, he says, yeah, this... He gives up whatever he gives up, moves up to the Himalayas or wherever he moves and says, yeah, it was nice to be in the city, have a wife, have a home, have money, have all of this TV and stuff like that. But it's all artificial. I'd rather be pursuing the self-realized state. Mm -hmm. So those are the three conditioned states of consciousness, the waking state, the subtle body and the causal body <clears throat> and the physical body. Um, we talked about the characteristics of a self-realized person that he looks the same, but his selfish desires drop off. Now comes verse 20, in which, having given up all attachment to the fruits of action, being content, happy, and not depending on anything, he doesn't do anything, although he is engaged in action. So how do you not do anything and be engaged in action? So when we say that we have vasanas and desires that make us want to do things, we're doing it because of our desires. Mm. Here, the self-realized person is doing it because he ought to do it. This is his duty. He recognizes that he has to do service and sacrifice, and that is his path to self-realization. So he does it, but without desire, as we said in verse 19, without expectation, and all he does is he says, I don't care what the results are. Whatever the results are, I'm going to do it. And whatever comes of it, fine. And actually, that attitude gets him more mental peace, more material rewards, as well as drops off his vasanas. You'll see this. These three things happen. The mental peace, the um, material, because as your mind becomes more peaceful, you become more productive. Mm -hmm. And your productivity is noticed by your boss or the world or whatever, and you get material prosperity. And your vasanas are dropping off because you're doing it without expectation and without desire. Right. Such a master is at peace with the external world. So verse 20 is where you're talking about self-realized person being at peace with the external world. Then we'll see the internal world and then um, others. Um, such a master has given up his desires for the fruits of actions, and he remains happy with his own bliss. He doesn't need the world to give him bliss. What do you and I, all of us, need? We need the world to fulfill our void inside. Right. Um, we are we are relying on the external world for happiness. He is self-sufficient in his happiness. He doesn't need anything else. In fact, other stuff from the outside distracts him and makes him unhappy. So wherever there's dependency, there is sorrow. When you're dependent on the world for your happiness, there's unhappiness in a way because the world cannot make you happy. And when it does try, you say it's not to my satisfaction. So either way, it's... Right. Rarely that you get very happy with it. And when you do get it, <clears throat> excuse me, when you do get that happiness because of some, it's short lived because you say, I want more or I want it slightly different. So the self realized person continues his actions. Really speaking, he's not doing anything, he's just fulfilling his own duty. And with that, he's happy. Verse 21 a self realized soul wants nothing and has his mind and body controlled, it's under his control, he has relinquished all possessions, and he does actions with his body without any desires for the results. Therefore, he develops no vasanas. So you remember we had talked about how previous lives, you have vasanas, you have desires, you do action that actually produces more vasanas, which go into your prakriti, and you're born with it the next time. Right. Here... A self-realized person is in harmony with his internal world. He has no expectations. His mind and body is completely controlled, so he has no uh, calm, crowd, lobe. He has no desires, he has no anger, and he has no greed. He has no craving for further enjoyment. And how do we feel? We feel empty. So we reach to the world to try and fulfill our emptiness. Now he talks about possessiveness here. 
he has relinquished his possessions, shouldn't be misunderstood to say he'd given up everything right. because he's moved to the mountains and he has no possession. There's interesting videos on YouTube if you want to watch it. It's really fascinating. Um, if you want the titles, write to me, I'll get them to you. But it shows that these uh, people who are up there, yogic masters, are without any clothes except for maybe a loincloth. And they're living in the caves underneath the ice. And they're walking around barefoot with no clothes except for a loincloth, no food. There's no fresh vegetables there. There's no roots to eat. I don't know how they survive, <laughs> but the videos show them in their caves. Now, and by the way, there was a young uh, woman. She's 19 years old. She left England and said she has a drive to go to India, goes up to the Himalayas and insists that she wants to become a Tibetan monk. Mm -hmm. The monks are shocked that a woman is coming, but, you know, they ultimately accept her. And they say, you've got to go live 12 years in this cave up in the mountain to become self-realized. Wow. And she does. And she does. And it's a true story. It's, you can see it on YouTube or read up on it. Mm -hmm. um, she stays 12 years in this cave, becomes self-realized, and then travels the world um, trying to get other women to recognize that they can also uh, choose this path. And she's a very strong woman's movement for this. Uh, but in her video, in the cave, she has possessions. So we've got onto this switch tracks a little bit. Right. But in her cave, she has possessions. Um, they're not like beds and mattresses and pillows and nothing like that. Uh, but possessions, you need just to go down to the river uh, to get some water in the warm weather. She needs a container. Without a container, how are you going to bring water back to your place? Right. Uh, she needs something that she needs to say, okay, this is what I'm going to cook. Uh, so roots and stuff like that that she's brought up from the villages. She has some clothing that she has to cover her body with, something that she needs. All of these are possessions. What this verse says is that a self-realized person does not have possessiveness towards the possessions. That's the difference between a right. self-realized person and us, because we don't have any, we, we have possessions, but we are possessive. We lose right. one little thing and we are distraught. It is important to recognize that as you grow spiritually, and I can tell you this from personal experience, that when I first met Gautam Jain and started this study through the um, my wife having pointed me to this direction, I if I lost a pen, I would be miserable. <laughs> and, you know, certainly I'm nowhere near uh, some other gurus. But to tell you the truth, now I lose things and I say, it's okay. Yeah. I don't have that sense of possessiveness. And that's just one inch along that line, that big ladder, which is going to take me thousands of lives to get to. But I'm saying to you, friends, that even if you move that one inch, there's a huge difference in how you feel. Right. Having, don't, not having possessions towards, possessiveness towards your possessions makes a difference. Now, I'm not saying that there is no limit to how much I feel that my possessions, which include my wife, my kids, my grandchildren, my home, uh, you know, if something were to happen to that, I would be distraught. Right. But a self-realized person does not get distraught no matter what happens. So that's something to keep in mind. It's the, it's, and I forget where I, I got these examples, but I'll just tell them to you. These are not from Gautam Jain, but it, he talks about a pond that has no ripples, and somebody throws a stone in it. Right. And immediately what happens is there's ripples all along. And after a while, the ripples go away, and the pond is still again. So what he says is that a self-realized person is like a pond that is not disturbed. When you disturb it, there's no doubt that there will be some disturbance but it will not last long. It will last like right. the pond. It'll go away quickly. Whereas somebody like us mm -hmm. who is not self-realized, one little thing happens and you obsess about it. You think about it. You say, he said this to me. I'm going to get back at him, that kind of stuff. So right. recognize that even if you move a little bit along this spectrum, you will feel much better. The other example was that of a mirror, that a mirror, you don't see your face 
unless you actually go and put your face in front of the mirror. And the mirror doesn't keep your face. The minute the f your face moves away, the mirror is black to being blank. That's how a self-realized person is. Hmm. And then the next question is, why should you not have possessiveness towards your possessions? What's wrong with being possessive? Because that disturbs your mind. Having those that possessiveness towards your possessions disturbs your mind. And you, the more disturbed your mind is, the less productive you are, the more right. peaceful you are, the less you can rely on your abilities to become self-realized. And you don't just have to, to lose your possessions to have your mind deserve, uh, disturbed. You just have to think about possibly losing them. I'm sorry? You don't have to lose your possessions to have your mind disturbed. You just have to think about losing them. Yeah, just, just to the worry anxiety, about losing them. Yeah. Just the anxiety that you might lose is enough to cause you mental disturbance. Yeah. And so the attitude that we should go through life with is that this is not none of this is ours. It doesn't matter. If you if you have something that doesn't belong to you, pick up something that you found on the street and you're walking around with it, say, I'm going to give it to somebody, you walk for a mile or two and say, where am I going to leave this? Who's going to find it? You know, you just put it on the side. You say, I, I, you know, whoever yeah. finds it, I'm going to leave it here. And you walk on. You don't think about it as yours. It's something that didn't belong to you in the first place. Similarly, you go to a anything. You go to tool rental place and you rent a, uh, a drill, the big drill that you don't possess, and you bring it home and you try to drill a hole in the cement wall and then the drill bit breaks. Right. You say, ah, darn. You don't feel the same way as you would if it were your own drill or your own drill bit. You take it out, you say, I'm going to take it back to them and say, your drill bit broke, they'll put a new one, I'll bring it back and I'll start working on it. Yep. That lack of possessiveness towards that is what we need to carry on throughout our life with that lack of possessiveness towards our possessions. I like the example you always use about renting a car and what happens to if you damage a rental car as opposed to damaging your own. And so that rental attitude of that's the difference a rental car and a owning a car is the difference between having a possession and just having something that you use. Right. Yes, that is the example that Gautam Jain and Swami Parthasarthi give about a rental car and going through a pothole. The other example they give is that of a hotel room. Yeah. They say you might have the same TV in your home or even a better TV at home and the same mattress, same pillows, same everything. But it's just like you feel carefree. You enjoy yeah. the hotel room, the TV, and you say, oh, what a nice bed this is. Yeah. Even though, why? Because you don't have that feeling, oh, I'm going to spill something on the bed. I'm going to, you know, damage the TV. There's no care about it in that. And that's how you would feel if you weren't possessive towards uh, your possessions in life. Yep. I like those examples. Verse 22. He acts, but he is not bound. As he is content with whatever he gets, without seeking it, and he is above dwandwas, which are the pairs of opposites. He does not envy others. He is balanced whether he's successful or not. So whatever he does, since he doesn't have any expectations, everything has opposites. In life, the scriptures say that everything has opposites. Heat, cold, sorrow, uh, happiness, mm -hmm. um, success, failure, etc. So he acts. But again, because he doesn't have desires and because he doesn't have expectations, he is not bound as he is content with whatever he gets. In, in, in India, you have what is known as prasad, that I, I think even in the Christian tradition, Lou, you go, you make an offering to um, uh, God, and then at the end of it, the priest gives you something like a biscuit or yeah. a something that he gives you and you say, you know, thank you for that. It's right. like whatever you give as a sacrifice, you get back something, whatever it is, maybe a small little uh, fruit or apple or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he takes it without seeking it. And whatever he gets, he's happy with it. Right. So whatever results come of his actions, unsought, he is happy with it. And he's above the pairs of opposite. This is very important. Just like he has no greed and no anger and no desires, he is balanced in his pairs of opposites. When one thing comes, he says, it's okay, the other will come soon thereafter. And that's almost a guarantee. 
It will never be consistently one and not the other. He does not envy others. He's balanced whether he's successful or others, or, or successful or not. So most people in the waking world are envious of others. They achieve something, they're happy, but then they look to say, what else did somebody else get? Right. They say, oh, he got more than me. I got more than him. I got more than him. You're arrogant. I got less than him. You're jealous or envious. So this verse 22 shows how a self-realized person is har har harmonious as far as the environment. He's not concerned with the environment. He's satisfied in doing what he ought to do, regardless of what he's getting out of it. And of course, we always look at the three levels, body level, mind level, and intellect level. At the body level, he rises above the pairs of opposites, heat, cold, success, failure, war, peace, birth, death. So like this person in the Himalayas, in the snow and ice with just a loincloth, doesn't constantly think like I would, oh my God, it's <laughs> cold, I need to get away from this. Right. His mind is beyond that. At the mind level, his emotions. He loves everybody. So there's no envy. It's like if my child or my grandchild got something great, I wouldn't feel envious of right. him. I'd be happy for him because there's that love there. Such a self-realized person has love for everybody. So he's he doesn't feel any negative feelings towards them. At an intellect level, there's perfect balance on his part towards success and failure. All of us, whether in business or work or whatever, occasionally have failures. We also should say that success will follow. It's never failure, 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 failure all the time. Right. Never um, heat, 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 heat all the time. And it balances. So how do you deal with these dwandavas? You wait for the other to come. And you think to yourself, whatever this is, this will pass and something else will come immediately afterwards. So verse 23, the self-realized person is liberated from the world. He's not attached to either the external goings-on of the world, nor to the internal men mental conditions in his own mind, nor to the effects of his actions. His actions are of service. Now, we're getting into a very important area yeah. here, which we already discussed. This is a prelude to those 12 yagnas that I ref referred to in the beginning. Um, his actions are of service and sacrifice, which in Sanskrit is called yagna, Y-A-G-N-A, yagna. Very important term, very important for us because we're going to keep coming back to this. That is really the mantra for, um, for service and sacrifice. Yagna means sacrifice dedicated towards a higher ideal. If one does service and sacrifice, one exhausts one's desires and, and vasanas. Any service has to be without any hope of getting anything back. If you have any ho some hope, let's say, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to get this back, then that's wasted. Mm -hmm. So when you do something, service, without any expectations of getting anything back from it, only then are you achieving the desired goal of getting rid of your vasanas. Our actions arise from our prakriti, right? All the previous lives, all our desires, vasanas that have come up in us and we're doing something, we're doing it because of that drive from within our prakriti. A self-realized person, actions comes from the present because he ought to do it, not because there's a desire from his prakriti. Such a person without attachment to anything is free. His mind is established in his self. He has knowledge. And such a person's actions are a perfect example of worship. Hmm. All the rest of us, our worship is just trying to worship. His worship is true worship because he's not looking to get anything out of it. Right. So his actions are of service and sacrifice to do a yagna. And what exactly are these yagnas? And we'll go into that in the next episode. Last verse for today is verse 24 which is the ritual of yajna, he says, everything is Brahman, says Krishna. The grains, the ghee, the fire, all human activities are said to be Brahman. All beings are Brahman. All their activities are Brahman. Their goals in life are Brahman. 
all, everything is Brahman. The entire world is nothing but a projection of Brahman, just as the entire dream is a projection of the waker's mind, right? right. So the dream, you take any aspect of it, is all an aspect of my mind in my dream. Your mind, your dream is a projection of your mind. So similarly, this whole world, our actions, every little grain in it, every person in it, every being in it, every tree in it, every rock in it is a projection of Brahman. So this verse says, whatever you do, whatever you think you're doing, whatever you're getting out of it, whatever you're praying to is all Brahman. And so this will take us now to the next stage, which are probably some of the most important verses in the Gita from verse 25 all the way through verse 30. So about six verses that are very, very important, and we'll do that next time. I would really appreciate it if you would go to Facebook, if you have any comments, criticisms, suggestions, questions, put them on, and we'd be happy to answer them. Um, of course, if you're not doing this on Facebook, you can get this on any podcast, right? right? Yep. Uh, Lou, what are those various podcasts? Uh, Apple Podcasts, in? Google Podcasts, Spotify are the most popular, but almost any place you shop for your podcast, you'll find us. So thank you very much, folks, and we'll see you next time.